Hello again, I'm Doug Smith, and welcome to the 23 March 2018 edition of Portsmouth This Week. Uh, our guests today are Mike Asciola, the Assistant Town Planner, and Jeff Broadhead, Executive Director of PRISM, the Partnership for Rhode Island Streetlight Management. And our topic is going to be the LED Streetlight Replacement Project. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you. Uh, Mike, maybe I could start with you. Uh, uh, could you give us a little bit about your background and, and what you do as the assistant town planner? Sure. Um, I'm in about my fourth year with the, uh, the town of Portsmouth. Um, before that, I was um, the town planner in Johnston for a year and a half or so. And before that, uh, I was in Kittery, for, Kittery, Maine, for about four years and uh, Lincoln, New Hampshire, for a year. Um, I got my bachelor's in environmental design and urban policy at uh, UMass Amherst. And, um, I handle a lot of the uh, zoning issues in town and uh, GIS and uh, and then the, the planning um, research and uh, and plan preparation. Yeah. So. I noticed Gary's got you right next to the door, so every Yahoo that comes <laughs> in there has to walk by and ask you a question, I'm sure. Oh, yeah. Uh, the uh, LED project, you know, on the face of it, I've read through some, some things and it seems like it's so obvious, why didn't we do this before? But how, how did we get into this? How did Portsmouth come to realize there's a potential for saving money? Um, well, um, I, I guess the in, started in 2011. Um, there was kind of a movement. Um, Jeff uh, Broadhead uh, kind of spearheaded a lot of that with uh, and, and getting the legislature to pass a law um, that allowed towns to purchase the, the streetlight systems from um, National Grid at a prorated amount um, and then be able to um, to manage the maintenance and um, and what kind of lighting that, that they installed. So um, when, when National Grid controlled that, they weren't incentivized at all to uh, provide um, energy efficient lighting, um, and that's what we're we're doing. Okay, now I understand this came out of a Leadership Matters program. Um, it actually there. It, we use the the LED program um, as kind of our our, our model to uh, um, kind of use the skills that we learned through that leadership program um, and, and work the project through. So they're kind of two separate two um, separate things. things. Okay. Yeah. Um, I guess uh, let me get right to the chase here uh, before we get to Jeff, and I'm sure he'll tell, give you some more reasons. But how would how would an LED replacement LED Streetlight program help the town. Uh, well, it's the the savings in energy. There's less energy being consumed. It's a, a better for the environment, um, and it, it provides a better. The LED lighting is a clearer um, light than the high pressure sodiums that that we have currently um, in our system. Yeah, so. and that coincidentally it saves us money, as I recall. Oh, yeah. Look at this stuff. Uh, about 60% savings with LEDs. Yeah, that's a lot. I mean, what do we pay right now, for example, for 140,000 or something like that? I think it's, like a, it's about that. Yeah, and if we could get that down to 40, 50 grand, that's some money savings right there. Anyway, let me, uh, I wonder if, if maybe I should go to Jeff on this question. How do, you, how do we get involved in this program, Portsmouth, how did we, and then what is the process for doing this? Uh, and where are we in Portsmouth, kind of, on this process? That's a lot a of questions. Question. That's a great question. Over to you. I'll go to sleep <laughs> now. Okay. And I wish, that, I wish that I could say there is a specific set process. But every community is different. And, and every community goes at its own pace, makes decisions in its own way. Some communities are much more money-driven. Some are more environmentally driven. Um, and uh, so this, this program is, is really designed to meet any community's needs. And in, in that it has tremendous dollar savings. It has tremendous um, environmental benefits. Um, and it's, as, as Mike said, it's far better light. And, and the first responders, cops, love these lights. They can see they have better, it's called, technically it's called small object delineation. And you can see small things in the road much better with LED lights. They're sharply defined. Colors stand out better. Yeah. And, and if we were in this studio, under high pressure sodium lights like is the current street lights, you would not see any colors in our clothing. It would look completely monochromatic. 
Um, so studios use these bright um, either LED or metal halide lights which provide a good quality light. That's what your street lights are going to be. So the grass is going to look green under the street lights. The cars are going to look red and blue and some of them black and white under the street lights. Uh, so it, it really varies. The process is fairly straightforward um, in that the first thing a community does is to purchase the assets from National Grid. But in order to do that, you have to do a cost-benefit analysis. Um, Prism did that for the town of, <coughs> excuse me, for the town of Portsmouth, and and we asked and answered three questions in that analysis. The first one was, does it make sense for the town to purchase the assets from National Grid? The answer was yes. Um, when we did the study, Portsmouth was spending about 125,000 a year. It's more than that now, and uh, the of that. 70,000 a year is National Grid's maintenance on the street line. When you, and everybody has their own op opinion about how well National Grid is maintaining the lights. And uh, when the community purchases its lights and PRISM then handles the maintenance, the maintenance cost alone goes from 70,000 to National Grid to about 20,000 for PRISM. And that's about what it costs us to replace every light that goes out over the course of a year when you have, Pr Portsmouth has about 1,000 lights. So there's a lot of, and if you think about streetlights, they're these little, very high-tech objects, 25 feet in the air, on a pole, subject to wind, rain, birds' nests, um, all kinds of environmental factors. And there's a thousand of them all over the town. So it takes a lot to maintain those. Um, and so uh, the, the initial savings is just from the purchase. Portsmouth will, will save, um, will reduce their cost from uh, about 125, 130,000 down to about 80,000 um, just by purchasing the lights. Then the conversion to LED reduces the amount of energy the lights use, and re um, it certainly reduces the greenhouse gas effects of the lights. Um, and so, because you're burning far fewer kilowatt hours of electricity, and in you know, Portsmouth, a lot of its energy is renewable. So, it's not as much of an environmental benefit in this community as there are in others because it's a very forward-thinking town. Um, but the, the the bottom line is that we reduce the electricity use by about 63%. Okay. Now, in this process of first discovering there is all this stuff and then sec second getting involved in it, where are we, Portsmouth? What stage are we at right now? In other words, I would guess one of the things you'd have to do is do an inventory uh, to make sure that you have a good handle on the numbers. Yeah. So. We've done that. Yeah, we've completed the audit. Um, right now, we're we're in the kind of the design phase um, and, and figuring out where um, where the lighting is going to be. And, and these lights will actually be able to communicate with with each other and report outages. So it's it's important that their their spacing is uh, at a certain distance in order to um, for them to interconnect in, into the network. Okay. So essentially, what we're talking about, if I could just summarize real quickly, is the town would, would buy the existing street lights and the poles, I guess, or whatever, from National Grid. Re replace them with LED lights, which are much more efficient and energy saving. And then, based on all that, we'd end up saving money, certainly, at least over the, the s several years. I imagine there's some upfront costs for the town in getting into this. Are right. we at the point we, where we need to Come up with upfront costs right now. We'll have the exact when we finish the design. The design is close. It'll probably be finished this weekend. Uh, the audit was was done, and this map shows um, part of the audit. Each dot is a street light. Each color is a different wattage. And what happens over the years? National Grid has maintained this system for many many years. And uh, sometimes when a street light goes out, they replace it with the same street light. Other times, in order to get the light fixed quickly, they happen to only have a different wattage light or a different technology light, and they would put that up. There's no fault to them, and it just kept the system operating. But what you have now when you go down a street in Portsmouth is you have multiple technologies. That means the lighting is different colors. You have multiple wattages, so the lighting is different brightnesses. None of us notice that, and I live and breathe street lights, and I don't even notice it very often. What you will notice is when it converts to LED, we design every street so that you have uniform lighting on the street. It's even, it's colored, it's spaced nicely. Uh, you will see fewer lights as you look down, even there's just as many there, because they don't have big globes under them that glow. Uh, what you'll also see is they're brighter, sometimes if there's a sharp corner, we'll put brighter there. 
um, if there's a, an old folks home or if there's a, a bar that's troublesome and needs more light, we'll put more light in those areas. So the system's designed and it's designed, we, our designer does it and then the town will look at every single light and say, yes, we like this, we don't like that, change it. It's very easy to do. Uh, and then with the control system that, that Portsmouth is looking at, we have the ability to dim and brighten any lights in the town. Uh, these lights self-report when they're out. Um, we just, in one community, just um, turned on the self-reporting and lo and behold, despite um, this is the city of Providence. Despite handling about 30 to 40 outages a week that citizens report, there were another 300 that nobody knew about. But when we turned this thing on, all of a sudden we get little red dots all over the map, and we started sending the trucks out to yeah. fix those. Um, and, and that's a safety factor. Maybe nobody has reported the light out, but that's a dark spot in the street where the town is expecting there to be light. So this system is the first one ever. Um, the technology didn't allow this before. But now this this technology is it's 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 working. Okay, now would that be considered an intelligent lighting system? That's an intelligent control. And yep. and how does the information get back to like where would it come into the town well, hall? Or? It's super low power radios in each one, much less than what your cell phone has. You think about your cell phone, you've got to be able to hold it right up to your ear, and connect to a tower that might be some several miles away. The streetlights only have to talk to the next streetlight. It's called a mesh network. So this streetlight talks to this one, which talks to that one, and they pass the signal. Uh, and about every thousand lights, which means we'll probably need one gateway, which goes into, which takes the streetlight information, puts it onto the internet, and then it goes to the control center, which is in San Jose, California. I'm sorry, it's not in Rhode Island. There isn't one here, uh, and and then comes back. So if I tell a light to dim from, say, I'm out in the field, and, and Mike calls up and says, the lights are too dim on, on East Main Road in this area. I go out and look at it. I can do it from my office. He can, he'll be able to do it from his office. And he'll dial it up, and that signal will go from his computer to San Jose out to the street light. The light will brighten. It'll say, I'm brighter. Goes back to San Jose, back to his computer, and he can see right on there the amount of wattage it uses, see that the wattage goes up. Yeah. Um, these things tell us um, what's wrong if a light goes out. Yeah. They can tell us if it's bad wiring or if it's internal or if it was a voltage surge. Uh, unsurprisingly, we get a lot of voltage surges in, in most of National Grid's territory. And, and it's not enough to affect the old um, sodium lights much, but it affects the LEDs. So we have to have surge protection in the LEDs, and we buy very high surge protection. And yet we've still had lights blow uh, with black streaks coming out of them. So, you know, National Grid's electricity is not, it's not uniform. It's, it's, it really varies and nobody's, uh, I guess they know why it varies, but we don't. Yeah. Uh, Jeff, I, I wanted to get at your background a little bit because I think you got a great background. I just wonder if you could talk to uh, briefly and then I'll get, we'll get back to the LED lighting system. If you could tell us briefly what your background is, how you got involved in this, is what is PRISM and what does it do? Well, I'm old. My background is long, and, 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 and I have one of those resumes that if you look at it, you either say, wow, he's done a lot of different things, or you say he can't hold a job, right? <laughs> and I don't know which one it is yeah. <laughs> over the years. I've worked for local governments on the West Coast and the East Coast. I've um, worked for and I've run consulting firms on both sides, all revolving around the uh, socioeconomics of society. Uh, my... my uh, Education is I have degrees in economics and environmental studies. I have a master's in business administration. And uh, I put these all together to do PRISM. Yeah. And, and w throughout my career, the, the focus has been on doing what's, just doing what's right and what's good. Uh, and, and when I was doing energy work at the Washington County Regional Planning Council, which represents communities in s southern Rhode Island, we were looking at energy bills. And I was trying to check the spreadsheet that our, we had nine um, energy fellows, student interns, doing the work. <clears throat> and this, I had a 14,000 line electric spreadsheet and I was trying to find mistakes in it. And I, you know, first I thought I can't possibly do this. Uh, then I added a column in it, which uh, they had put in the kilowatt hours used and the total bill amount, but they didn't put the price per kilowatt. There's no need to, it's the same everywhere. But by adding that column, I was able to find out, did they input the numbers correct? I was just looking for mistakes. Because if you've seen kids work these days, They've got music going, they throw papers to each other, they're shouting across the room, 
and the work that gets done is flawless, but it doesn't look like it could ever be flawless. So uh, as I was going down the spreadsheet, I noticed it was, it was, um, it was the, at that point, electricity was about 11 cents. So we're seeing 11, 11, 9, 11, 11, 10, 79. I said, okay, I found a mistake. And I did that a number of times. It turns out every one of those mistakes was a streetlights line. And the reason is that it wasn't a mistake. It's the streetlights are charged differently. Electricity to this building, to your home, to this t town hall, is all there's a meter. National Grid delivers electricity to that meter. And then everything that's inside it belongs to the town. And, and if, if Mike gets a new computer, he uses a little more electricity, the meter spins a little faster. Streetlights are different. They're not metered. So National Grid has two ways of charging for them. They charge what's called a facility charge. And that is that they, uh, it's not per kilowatt hour. It's got nothing to do with the electricity used. It's a charge for the operation and maintenance of the light. In, in uh, Pawtucket, I mean, <laughs> sorry, Portsmouth's place, that is about 72 or $3 per light per year. That's the charge for maintenance of the light. And it seemed like a lot to me when I saw that. Um, we do the same thing for about $20. That's a reasonable charge. That's about what it costs. PRISM also is designed, we designed PRISM as a nonprofit to serve municipalities. So the goals are to provide the most cost-effective service we can. Obviously, that's, we wouldn't be in business. They wouldn't choose us if we couldn't do something like that. <clears throat> but what's important to a municipality is to have a flat budget for the fiscal year. You don't want surprises in the middle of the year. So we structure our maintenance contracts so that we do. We charge a certain amount all year. At the end of the year, we will sit down with the town. We will say, OK, you know, we collected uh, $82,000. I'm just making the number up. Um, and yet we only spent on your behalf 62000 So this 20000 left. We'll lower your rate next year, or we'll hold it in reserve in case we have a spike next year. Because there's a lot of things that can affect it. A bad sure. storm can affect it. Uh, I just do also want to correct one thing. You said by the polls. In most cases, the polls are joint use polls. They're owned by National Grid and Verizon. And the street light is just an attachment to the pole. Okay. And so you buy the arm that the light's on. We call it the mast arm. National Grid calls it a bracket. At the end of it is the light fixture. You buy that and the wire that goes up to the grid's secondary line. The only time that the town will buy a pole is if it is, <coughs> if it is street light only. For example, along Park Avenue down on the beach, there's decorative poles. Those are just street light. They don't carry telecom. They don't carry electricity. Um, so those, the town uh, would buy those. Uh, so for the most part, the town does not buy poles. Okay, we're not buying poles. We're buying the little part with the light yep. on it. You buy a few poles and mostly just the light. Just okay. the lights. Uh, fascinating stuff. And uh, it sounds like you're doing good work here, so keep that up. Uh, are you a Portsmouth resident yourself? No. I am a graduate of Rogers High School, though. Oh, okay. uh, no, I grew up in Jamestown. Okay. Yeah, we were oh, across the bridge. My God, across the bridge. You except, your passport? Except you I'm old enough. <laughs> I took the ferry to high school every day. Yeah. I was the last year. Uh, I graduated in 1969, yeah. and, and w the bridge was being built as we went back and forth on the ferry. Yeah, so. I know what you mean. I was back here in the 60s. So. Yep. Uh, okay, let's get back to, the, to where we are in Portsmouth. And I guess since other communities have already done this, right, in, in Rhode Island, Yes. Uh, what kind of comments or, or you know, uh, suggestions or whatever come from citizens in these towns about these lights? Have you heard what are the good and the bad? Well, they're almost always, there's just, the vast majority of them are, there are two. It's too bright, it's not bright enough. Okay. We've got that for the same light yeah. from people on the same side of the street. It's too bright, it's not bright enough. What's different about the LED light, most of the ones, that we've installed, and I want to separate Charlestown out. If you if you if you feel like driving around and looking at experiencing LED lights, this this this, you can go to Tiverton, and you'll see a 3,000 Kelvin light. That's a light that's a little bit warmer color, a little bit softer than what most of the lights you'll see in town, in most towns. Uh, if you go to Charlestown, you're going to see 4,000 Kelvin light. This is the same color light that we used in 26,000 other street lights in Providence and Central Falls and West Warwick and others. But in, in Charlestown, it's the only one that shows an indirect light. It's, it's, a, it's the state-of-the-art street lighting. <laughs> These things are changing all the time. They're getting more and more efficient. Um, they're not getting any cheaper, <coughs> but you're getting more light for the same dollar. 
And, and this light in, in, it has no super bright spot. Most of the lights you'll see in Providence are 4,000 Kelvin, so it's a nice white light. And um, it's not blue. We don't buy them that are off. You know, some LEDs are off in the blue range. Those are 5,700 Kelvin lights. They're, they're super efficient, but people just don't like them. They're just unpleasant. So yeah. we buy on the pleasant end, and the 4,000 seems to be the sweet spot. Every time we've had a police chief come into our office and look at the three and 4,000 Kelvin light, um, they've chosen the 4,000. Citizens sometimes prefer the 3,000. And so most of the communities have gone with the police chief and, and made that choice. We're going to be bringing a display over to Town Hall in Portsmouth that shows those two color lights. Um, a lot of people won't be able to see the difference. Some people will see the difference. And, and so the town will have that available to look at for a while. I'm not sure when, when yeah. we'll bring it over, but yeah, maybe probably next week. the next couple yeah. of weeks. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. set it up. Uh, now, if, are there any nearby towns like Jamestown? Are they involved in this at all? Jamestown has done its study, but has um, not yet done the audit. Okay, so uh, we're ahead of them essentially in where we are, right? That's correct. Yeah. That's correct. Uh, I, I'm just thinking of towns maybe where people, when they drive through, they could just see what those Tiverton. lights look like. Tiverton and Bristol. Yep. Bristol too? Yep. Okay. Yep. We didn't do Bristol and Barrington, but they were done. Um, they they used our law, but they didn't uh, do it. In fact, I want to say that this law was, it would never have passed in a single session if it wasn't for the leadership of Repergiro, Deborah Giro from um, Middletown and Jamestown. Yeah. Uh, and, and she really got it through and over the line. And, and, and bills like this usually take several years to pass. And we were fortunate. We were fortunate. The environmentalists liked it, the energy geeks liked it, and the municipalities liked it. So it, it, it went through. Okay. Um, All right. So uh, I, what I like about I like this intelligent lighting system, which I assume is what we're looking at, right? Yep. Uh, and that it links together all these things. Uh, one of the things I was reading about was, for example, if you have to do an evacuation route somewhere, you could turn those on and turn them up a little bit so people could see where you're going. Does that, does that make sense? You're looking <laughs> at me like that doesn't make sense. Well, I somebody, mean, can you, if you have all this stuff coming into yeah, a central no, place, me, can we, you tweak it? We told you, I personally told you, that you would be able to do that that you'd be able to set it up so that if you have an evacuation, the lights can sequentially flash. Okay. And it actually can be done, but it's not going to be done. It is too much programming. It's not almost on the fly, which we were told. Um, most of the other capabilities that we were told it does. So we can brighten and dim any light. We can turn them off. We can turn them on. Yeah. But to get them to do that sequentially is a uh, large-scale programming exercise. Okay. Now, the control system uses open source code, so it can be done, uh, and, but no community has chosen to pay f for that kind of coding. Sure. And um, it, it, I don't think it would be, I'd be surprised if it worked perfectly. However, we certainly can highlight, an if there's an accident at an intersection and the lights are not already at full brightness, we can brighten them. It's not as fast as you would like. It'll, it takes about three minutes for the, to, for between the, say it was a police dispatcher to do it. They'd have to log in, and, and most dispatchers don't have the time to do that when there's an emergency going on. So um, it's not something that's going to happen very often, but we also, brighten, we also light the intersections more brightly so that they would be, it, it, theoretically, you wouldn't have to do that. Yeah. If it's a residential street that dims at night, because these lights can be set to dim at any time during yeah. the night, um, then then it, then it could be fairly easily brightened from the police department if they wanted to. Yeah. Now, where, in the case of Portsmouth, where would the where would this thing be controlled from or be? Where would it's, we in Portsmouth? It's, it's cloud based, so I can control it from my iPad. Okay, just log in to. Yeah, it. Mike could do it from his phone. DPW could do it from the public works desk. Yeah. Um, it's a login system. Okay, so. We've already established that these LED lights are, are uh, more efficient than regular lights. Are they robust? Are they more, you know, they last longer than, than regular lights? Yes. The, the LED lights have a 10-year warranty, and some of them have been in the field for about 15 years. They haven't been 20 years yet. We're expecting that they're going to last more than 20 years with almost no diminution of light. The sodium lights that you have uh, very gradually lose their power. Uh, they have to be replaced in a, in a saltwater environment like, um, you know, where I live in Narragansett, yeah. 
or in Portsmouth, the, um, those lights last 18 to 24 months, and they have to be replaced every two years, every year and a half to two years. The LEDs, we've got a 10-year warranty, so we're expecting that they're going to last a long time. Okay. Now, let's assume that Portsmouth decides to continue on and, and, and go the route with intelligent lighting and all that stuff. Uh, if a, w would people still have to report street light outage? Like, there's a light in my street, but it's out? Or would this automatically come in and be taken care of? Hopefully both. Yeah. Hopefully both. It, um, hopefully a citizen will call. Uh, PRISM has a 24-7 call center, and it'll be right on Portsmouth's website, I assume. Yeah. And, and, and everybody in Portsmouth will know yeah. the number and have it on their telephones so that if somebody calls you know, Mike's office to say the street light's out, he'll say, please call this number. Um, or, or the town could decide to take the information and then pass it on to us themselves. I don't, it doesn't matter okay. to us how the information gets to us. We get it from the web, from email, from citizens' calls. Okay. Um, in some communities, they use a thing called um, C-Click Fix, which is an app for your phone. Uh, Providence has its own app called PVD311, which reports directly to us. So we get we get outage reports from lots of different sort of different areas, and okay, we, we treat them all the same. We we investigate. We make sure that it's really a pole. It's owned by I mean a light <laughs> that's owned by the community. We look at what the technology is. We look can we fix this remotely with the control system, and if we can't, then we dispatch a truck. That's okay, when the so, cost so comes the maintenance in. comes from you down the road. You, we subcontract the maintenance to electricians. We to yeah yep. Okay. Uh, I guess the, the, my other thought is, how are we socializing this with people in town? I mean, you know, we, well, this program is one way, I guess. Uh, we've sort of meandered all over the map here. Uh, yeah. But what else are we going to do? You're going to have this thing down there at the this setup, this demonstration kind of down at the town hall, yeah, we'll have so that people the, can see them. Yeah, we'll have that at the town hall, and we'll also have um, a page with links um, linked off of the the um, town's web page. Uh, okay. For, for public information. Uh, yeah, I, as I mentioned to you before the program, I've looked at the uh, document that you've already produced for the town, and which is quite impressive. Is that going to be available online as well? Yeah. Um, I guess I have have any of these communities that have gone to LED lighting like this uh, had any problems or concerns at all? It sounds like it's only you know the lights too bright, or the lights too dim. <laughs> Well, and, and often it's that the, what, what I say to someone if they call and they say the light's too bright, is I say the light is in exactly the same position as the old light. That's the first thing. So if, if it's shining in your bedroom window, the old light did too. Because we're not, almost, almost never do we move a light. Um, and and in, in one town we moved one at an intersection because it made more sense. It was shining in a window as the old light had, but the guy had cut the tree down, so now it was shining yeah, brightly in his window. In his but he also pointed out that the light where it had been placed, we put it right on the old mast arm, it wasn't getting the intersection. So we moved it. Now it's shining in the neighbor's window. So <laughs> sometimes you can't win for losing. It sounds like a good solution in Portsmouth, right? <laughs> Make, yes, yes. Listen, we're out of neighbors. time, guys, and I appreciate you both for coming in. It's, it's a fascinating subject, I think, and uh, there's plenty more that we could talk about. I could sit down and talk to you guys for the whole morning. But thanks for coming in, and I hope we see more of this on the website. Thanks for the opportunity. Thanks. Okay, thank you, and we'll see you ne again next time on Ports with This Week.